I'm Mike Brown, author, nerd, and host of the Dark Patine podcast. Join me and Morgan Knudsen, author, paranormal researcher, and host of the TV shows Paranormal 911 and Haunted Hospitals, as we take you on a journey for the curious about the unseen, the mysterious, and the incredible things happening in the world about us. Welcome to Supernatural Circumstances. Welcome to our inaugural episode on a topic that I'm sure we'll return to many times in other episodes of Supernatural Circumstances. As almost everyone I know has, ever since I was a child, I've wondered what happens to us after we die. We are, as far as we know, the only animal aware that one day we will pass away. American philosopher William James called the knowledge that we must die the worm at the core of human condition. That knowledge, he posited, creates in us a desperate imperative to avoid and deny the inevitability of that idea, resulting in humanity's drive toward life extension and immortality. Cultural anthropologist Ernest Becker's book addressing this, called The Denial of Death, ironically published posthumously, won the Pulitzer Prize in 1974. Humanity's hope and seeming psychological need for the survivalism of some part of our consciousness after death has led to a huge amount of research into the question, do we, in fact, somehow go on after we die? Early on in my own journey, I discovered the phenomena that is commonly called near-death experience, or NDE. The University of Virginia's School of Medicine webpage on the topic states, quote, Near-death experiences are intensely vivid and often life-transforming experiences, many of which occur under extreme physiological conditions such as trauma, ceasing of brain activity, deep general anesthesia, or cardiac arrest in which no awareness or sensory experiences of any kind should be possible according to the prevailing views in neuroscience. End quote. Throughout my quest for answers, I voraciously read everything I could find on the topic, including the classics like Life After Life by Dr. Raymond A. Moody and Melvin L. Morse's Transformed by the Light. I continue to absorb everything I can to learn more about this, life's biggest question. Just recently, a scholarly article indicated that we may in fact have our life flash before our eyes when we are in the process of dying. Researchers had connected EEG equipment to an 87-year-old patient's brain for an epilepsy study. During the session, unfortunately, the patient went into cardiac arrest and subsequently died after life-saving measures failed. However tragic, the event did give researchers an unprecedented look as they recorded 15 minutes of brain activity of a person in the throes of death. According to a press release, the researchers discovered rhythmic brainwave patterns around the time of death that are similar to those occurring during dreaming, memory recall, and meditation. Quote, Through generating oscillations involved in memory retrieval, the brain may be playing a last recall of important life events just before we die, similar to the ones reported in near-death experiences. Dr. Ajmal Zemar, a neurosurgeon at the University of Louisville and organizer of the study, speculated. He continued, These findings challenge our understanding of when exactly life ends and generate important subsequent questions, such as those related to the timing of organ donation. End quote. The press release goes on to say, while this study is the first of its kind to measure live brain activity during the process of dying in humans, Similar changes in gamma oscillations have been previously observed in rats kept in controlled environments. This means it is possible that, during death, the brain organizes and executes a biological response that could be conserved across species. Zemar continues, As a neurosurgeon, I deal with loss at times. It is indescribably difficult to deliver the news of death to distraught family members. Something we may learn from this research is, although our loved ones have their eyes closed and are ready to leave us to rest, their brains may be replaying some of the nicest moments they experienced in their lives, End quote. We understand this is not proof of life after death, but it is another piece of science that appears to be supporting our need to look more closely at these phenomena. Coming up, you will hear from Morgan as she digs into examples of NDEs and their potential impact. Afterward, you will hear our interview with Italian-born Scottish author, medical doctor, and speaker Piero Calvi-Paracetti. Originally specializing in public health and disaster management, 
Dr. Parasetti began a journey in 2010 toward applied psychical research, the practical application of the research findings, in particular for the benefit of the bereaved and the dying. He formally trained as a cognitive behavioral psychotherapist and developed an original counseling approach directed to those who suffer because of the loss of a loved one. Dr. Parasetti is a member of the Society for Psychical Research and of the International Association for Near-Death Studies. He sits on the Scientific Advisory Board of the Forever Family Foundation. Dr. Parasetti has written an incredible new book called Step Into the Light, and you can click a link to learn more about that in our show notes. Anyway, here's Morgan. Many think success means getting everything I want, and we say, That's what dead is, and there is no such thing as that kind of dead. Success is not being done, not being complete. Success is still dreaming and feeling positive in the unfolding. Abraham Hicks The fear of the dead coming back to haunt us or even kill us has been a fright that lasts to this day, or the fear of a loved one becoming stuck on Earth and unable to transition to a new non-physical reality has often played a role in our thoughts about death. It always surprises people when I tell them that there is no existing evidence in parapsychology or survival research to support these claims. As far back as survival research goes, even the best minds in the world from Princeton, Edinburgh, and Yale have found no evidence that this is the case at all. However, the living are another story altogether. If the paranormal has taught me anything throughout the years, it is this. Our loved ones aren't stuck. We are. And stuck looks like a number of different things depending on the individual. Those who have scientifically worked with mediums, such as the Winbridge Institute in Tucson, Arizona, have reported back consistently themed messages under double and triple blind studies. And that is... We are free, and we are joy. You are loved. Come and join us. It's not the belabored morning sadness that we've come to expect from Hollywood spirits or horror films, but it is the message that is consistently delivered again and again through the best channelers under study and those who have had near-death experiences, or NDEs. Perhaps one of the most significant experiences of our time was that of Dr. Eben Alexander, a neurosurgeon and brain researcher who underwent a near-death experience in 2008 during a coma caused by bacterial meningitis. His account of his NDE during the time he was unconscious sent a shockwave through the parapsychological and scientific communities because not only was his experience remarkable, he was a neurosurgeon and a man of science This wasn't a layman misinterpreting a dream. This was a man who brought both education and reputation to the table, and he was willing to put it all on the line to tell his story. For a long seven days, the entire neocortex of Eben's brain, which rules higher functions such as language and logic, was non-functional. At first, Doctors believed that it was a strain of E. coli that carried the threat of further spread, but upon further inspection, it was not. In fact, the doctors had never seen a case like this before and estimated his survival around 10%. It didn't look good. Bacterial meningitis, especially with the severity to put someone in a coma, was usually considered a death sentence if there was no recovery within a few days and despite pumping him full of every medicine they could think of, Eben's response to each one was poor. At best, the doctors anticipated that if he ever woke up, he would need care and have speech problems for the rest of his life. On the seventh day, the doctors approached the family with the news no one ever wants to hear about their loved one. Maybe it's time to stop treatment. However, it was just the words his son Bond needed to make For one last effort, he ran into his dad's room and begged him to wake up, and to everyone's surprise, Eben did just that. He opened his eyes and began choking on the breathing tube, which was promptly removed. Immediately, he looked at his family calmly and said, thank you, all is well. Unbeknownst to his family, this was just the beginning. 
After two months of recovery, Eben began to recount something that changed his life. While he was in the coma, he had an extraordinary experience, which began with losing the sense of all space and time and falling into darkness, losing his body, identity, memory, and language. His consciousness was clear, but it was attached to nothing, and he described himself as simply a point of awareness. He later referred to this state as the earthworm's eye view. After a period of time in this state, Eben noticed an object of brilliant light that began to spin and rotate, emitting beautiful fragments of gold and white as it spun, and broadcast a lovely song. He later called this the spinning melody. As he gazed upon it, he began to realize he was gazing through it, and, as he did, his vision opened up to a luscious country plain of green grass, rushing streams, waterfalls, and joyful people. Eben later recalled this place as the gateway. As he watched it, he began to fly across it, gliding effortlessly, and as he did so, a girl appeared beside him. She was soaring on millions of radiant colors, what he described as similar to the colors of a butterfly wing. The girl on the butterfly wing, as Eben now calls her, had a message for him which was clear and resounding. You are loved and cherished, dearly, forever. You have nothing to fear, and there is nothing you can do wrong. As he continued to soar through pink-tinted clouds and up even higher, he noticed he was also soaring with bright, shining orbs of light. They zipped about him, darting this way and that, and he instinctively knew these were intelligent beings, wiser and far older than he. His senses, like sight and hearing, were not separate here, and everything blended together in a cacophony of light and sound. Each time he had a question, answers appeared instantly and easily, like an explosion of love and wisdom. Everything he ever wanted to know was accessible, and there was no time between the question and receiving the answer. Eben then described arriving at an infinite void, or core, which was dark and yet full of light at the same time. What he experienced there would take a lifetime to unpack and understand, as he stated. Information flowed to him and through him, and he was able to recount only a fraction of it, that there is not one universe, but many, with many forms of life, that love lies at the center of all of them, and that although evil exists, including on Earth, because there is free will, it is relatively rare. Throughout his time there, he traveled between the spinning melody, the core, and the gateway repeatedly, and he found that what drove his movement was intention, not physical action. He played and journeyed through this expansive universe for ages until he tried to return to the gateway again and couldn't get in. He was devastated, and his intuition told him his experience was coming to an end. He heard beings talking to him and saying uplifting things to keep his vibration high and happy, and he began to see the faces of people he knew were important to him here on this planet. Eben began to feel himself losing touch with this realm, but the beings instructed him that this new reality was always with him. My mind, my real self, was squeezing its way back into the all too tight and limiting suit of physical existence with its bounds, its linear thought, and its limitation to verbal communication, he wrote. While many people keep their awareness of their physical identity during a near-death experience, Alexander did not, and he believed it what was allowed him to go further without any attachment to expectation. He went on to author a book about his experience entitled Proof of Heaven, A Neurosurgeon's Journey into the Afterlife. When asked about his experience, Eben wrote, Our truest, deepest self is completely free. It is not crippled or compromised by past actions or concerned with identity or status. It is a sentiment that I have experienced working with hundreds of haunted places as well. And it has been followed up by channelers such as Esther Hicks, Louis Benjamin, and Jane Roberts. What I have found most often when I'm dealing with the living is that we have a tendency to get hung up in the what is of our emotions. 
and grief is one of the most difficult emotions to move through. And we've been taught that the longer we hang on to grief, the more we must have loved that person. The worse we feel, the mo more love we must have had. It's a terrible premise, but one most of us grew up with. As soon as people saw someone having a glimmer of positive emotion around the idea of death, that person would be shunned as someone who is simply uncaring. Cultural roots play a part as well, and in many cultures, the spirits of the dead are simply seen as evil, or in some belief systems, they simply don't exist at all. Within the world and science of parapsychology, things are much different. Eben Alexander is not the only one to report these kinds of consistent, life-changing experiences upon death or coma, and he has not been the last. Although one thing had Eben troubled, Unlike many near-death experience reporters, he had not seen any loved ones he recognized. A hallmark of a near-death experience has often been the report of seeing loved ones in the shape or form which they are recognizable. And he had seen no one except the girl on the butterfly wing. His father, who had died a few months earlier, didn't seem to be there, and he began to doubt his experience entirely. His questions lingered until one day he received a photograph that sent his world reeling again. It was an old photo of a young girl, his biological sister, Betsy, who had passed away before he ever got the chance to meet her. He was stunned to see the face in the photo was none other than the beautiful girl on the butterfly wing. In that moment, he said, his conflict was healed. The worlds he lived in, which included fatherhood, his medical practice, his relationships, and his magnificent experience became one. And his doubts about the non-physical aspect of who we are and who we become were no more. What I have found in haunted places mirrors Dr. Alexander's sentiments completely. One of the things that I am often asked is, how do I talk to my loved one now that they have passed over? And usually these same people come to me with an empty pocketbook having paid all their money to psychics who have promised answers, or they simply have been told the spirit of their loved one is stuck on earth and there is no way for them to move on until they reach some sort of emotional closure or they are pushed along by the living. My lesson from this non-physical plane has been, the energy that creates worlds doesn't need human action to do what it does naturally. As humans, we put limits on this vastness that people like Evan Alexander describe, which are simply unrealistic and only serve to make ourselves feel more involved in the process. But the reality is, it is not our process to be involved in, and everything really is well and taken care of. Many reports of hauntings and spirits who have presented themselves to loved ones more often come with the same type of message that Evan received from the girl on the butterfly wing. I am okay. You are loved. This is not uncommon despite the horror tales we like to watch on television and the accounts of negative entities, which are another genre of paranormal activity entirely, not upset people lost and disconnected from who they really are. The reality is the evidence is overwhelming in favor of a non-physical world that is flourishing, full of love and well-being, the epicenter of knowledge and thought, and the core of everything we have ever imagined and beyond. The well-being that abounds here is hard for us living people to truly wrap our heads around, and perhaps we aren't supposed to quite yet. But we can get glimpses of it through the experience of people who have slipped into non-physical through things like near-death experiences or processes much less dramatic, like meditation. In simple processes like calming our minds, finding joy, and other such practices, speaking and reaching the consciousness that is non-physical and our loved ones who are now there is actually quite simple. The challenge is ourselves. Here's the conversation that Morgan and I had with Dr. Piero Calvi Parasetti. Piero, I'm so glad that you could be here today for Supernatural Circumstances because your book, Step Into the Light, is fantastic. And um, I read it cover to cover and it was it was really really insightful 
and there's a lot about you that is unique in the the world of parapsychology and a lot of the parapsychologists they do have other disciplines in science and things like that but you're also a medical doctor how did you make the transition from a doctor to the society of psychical research and the paranormal well uh Perhaps, first of all, thank you for having me. I am honored and, and, and thrilled to be talking to you and your audience. It's always a pleasure. Secondly, to answer your question, I wouldn't say exactly transition because the two things coexisted in parallel for a long time. Now, I've, I've took retirement from my, from my teaching um, position. But for many years, for nearly 15 years, I've, I've done both. I've done my, you know, uh, academic career as a public health lecturer and as a, I would say, an amateur scholar, but a scholar indeed <laughs> of psychical yeah. research. This happened because of, I all, I'm always fond of telling this story and, and, and because I know it goes down well, and it's the truth, you know, a, a, about what would have been uh, 2004, I was living in Geneva at the time in Switzerland, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I always stress that I am a, a Western educated medical doctor. That is, I, I grew up in an intellectual environment which maintains that anything and everything that exists is matter. If you cannot touch it, if you cannot measure it, it simply does not exist. And I went along happily with that worldview. I never had any reason to challenge it. And so I was, uh, you know, contemptuous to say, to, to use a, a politically correct word, a word, contemptuous of religious, religion, spirituality, and let alone anything, quote unquote, paranormal. Until the day when uh, uh, my wife, at, I remember very well, at the kitchen table, we were having tea uh, late afternoon, mid afternoon, and she happened to tell me a story that happened to her in, in her late adolescent years. And she, she is Scottish. She was living in Glasgow about more the, the age where she was about to leave the, the family home to, to move out into the world. And it's a, it's, it's a very, how could I say, menial story. It's cute. But I mean, in light of what I was to, to, to learn and read about in later years, that's a very simple wrapping incident, paranormal wraps that yeah. had an interesting conclusion. But to tell you the truth, uh, Morgan, it, the kind of story, if you or anybody else had told me that story back then, I would have smiled politely and, and, and moved on, you know, but that that was my wife, the person I know best and, and I trust most. And I could tell that, that that episode, which lasted a few months before the conclusion, it was, you know, and it made an impression on her. So I thought I, I owed it to her to, to, to look into this thing. And with this uh, stiff upper lip I had then, I said, hmm. Let me see if anything serious has been written about all this, you know, stuff. And I immediately stumbled upon the 575 pages of a book by a super credentialed academic psychologist, the late Professor David Fontana. And the title of the book was, Is There an Afterlife? A Review of the Evidence. Wow. So the, the author's credential were enough to, to overcome my boggle threshold. And boy, those 500 pages literally changed my life. And, and they were followed by another, I reckon, 30,000 to this day. And I became, as you, as you mentioned, a, a member of the Society for Psychical Research in the UK of the International so Association for Near-Death Studies in the US. I went to conferences, to study days. I even came to the US to train personally with the one I consider one of my intellectual heroes, uh, Dr. Raymond Moody, the, the, super, oh, yeah. the superstar author of Life After Life. Very much so. And, and, and at the end of this long, and, and it's not a linear process, it's a sine wave. You take 
three steps ahead and two steps back because you say, but this is not possible. I mean, what the heck are we <laughs> talking about? You see what I mean? And yeah. it's, it's not that you have a, a, a vision, an enlightenment, or, or I, I never had any experience, Morgan. Unfortunately, it seems that my, this incarnation of mine is for, for learning, for studying, for thinking is not for experiencing these kind of things. Maybe it will happen, but it hasn't so far. So it has been a, a, an arduous process of, of understanding what goes on and letting go of, of that non-critical acceptance of materialism. Oh, yeah. I, I so agree with, with, with what you were saying about just delving into this stuff and, and something... There's something about this about parapsychology that I think captures people's hearts in in a in a way that is unlike many other things in the world. And we've talked to just so many people about uh, exactly what you're talking about, where something, even JB Ryan, uh, you know, people like that had this moment where something just clicked and it became almost like a calling for them. Was it was it that way for you as well? It was indeed, to tell you the truth, to begin with, it was my, my intellectual interest that was really, really excited and stimulated and, and, and triggered, if you want. And so for a few years, it was a mud study and, and reading and this thing about conferences and blah, blah. The calling came later and, and, and has to do with my being a, a doctor and being a former humanitarian, you know, I worked right. for the International Red Cross and in, 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 in humanitarian affairs, my essential, and I know this is a trait of mine, that, that's who I am. I, I essentially need to be of help to others. That's, that's, that's life for me, essentially. And, and so, I, early enough, I recognized that I, what I was learning could be of potential great use to two categories of people. Those who are in pain because they've lost, they've lost a loved one and those who are in fear of death, their Absolutely. own or somebody else's. And so in, in a way, within the, the very broad um, field of uh, psychical research, my really area of specialty and, and where perhaps I've made a little contribution of my own is applied psychical research in particular. So the, the practical application of the results of research. And in my case is the application exactly for, you know, in, 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 in the context of uh, grief recovery, uh, counseling and assistance and in trying to assuage, if possible, the fear of death in those who, who have it. Yeah, I love that so much because that for me has been such a driving force for myself as well is that that statistically, you know, we know that the paranormal and these events usually bring more joy than they do fear. And there's such a misunderstanding, I think, at the, the core of this, that this is something that's terrifying and it should be be you know, frightful to, to, to people and, and whatnot. And, and there, there is just so much benefit from experiences that are, you know, that fall into the anomalous realm and, and things like near death experiences and stuff like that. I, I think there, there's so much there that is so beneficial to, to just the understanding of, of consciousness and, and people's everyday life. Absolutely. And, 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 and entirely, I remember a study years ago, that uh, say that actually it was the uh, this very interesting organization I'm honored to to work with. It's called the Forever Family Foundation. I love them. Uh, you know them already. Okay. Oh yes. Um, um, yes. I'm very very close. I'm a very close friend of uh, of Bob Ginsberg, and unfortunately Fran has passed away last yeah. year. And. <clears throat> They had published this very interesting study showing that the vast majority of people are happy to have seen a ghost. <laughs> so ex Absolutely. apparitional experiences leave people happy, contrary to, you know, the, the Hollywood blah, blah. And, uh, you know, that's that cliche that's, that's made to make money and not to reflect reality. So I'm, I'm entirely with you. And, and, and of course, 
the fact of knowing, rationally knowing, because what, what I find it's, it's a little sad in a way that many, many spiritual traditions and particularly organized religions have teachings concerning uh, a possible afterlife. But in my experience, those who follow those traditions do not benefit that much from, yeah. from, these, uh, from these sort of transmitted or imposed belief, beliefs. Whilst if, uh, if somebody understands rationally, that a belief in the afterlife is possible as a rational belief, a belief based on facts, on reason, on, on the um, knowledge and critical examination of evidence, I think that can truly be transformative for certain people, not for everybody, because you need a certain uh, personality and mentality to, 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 to go with that and to the, because it, it, it requires you to study. It requires you to, uh, to go through the same process you and I have gone through yeah. to, to in personally engage with the evidence, ask the questions, go those th three steps forward and two steps back for some time. And at the end, you're landed with, with your surrender and you say, yes, it is unbelievable but it is the truth. Absolutely. And once you've come to that rational realization, I believe that a, a considerable part of the pain of the loss and the fear of death can can be eased or removed. I couldn't agree more. And we and we see, like you were saying, time after time, you know, the statistics and the evidence backing that up now, where you know, I, I think it's become easier for people maybe to turn on their TV and get their information from, uh, you know, some, I don't know, you know, ghost hunting show or, or something like that, even if it's not what the studies are saying. And I think there's a, there's a gap there right now where the, the, the evidence is not being supported by the, the general pop culture, uh, I guess the, the general pop culture image that, that it's getting. And it's, it, to me, it's, the, the research and the work and the hundreds of years that have gone into this are they're almost getting bastardized by by the the idea that this is something that's horrifying and terrifying and that driving force to make to make money on it and you know you had a line in the opening of your book that I absolutely loved and you would ask the question imagine for a moment that your reason was convinced how would your heart feel and do you think that the, that that might be part of the gap that needs to be closed between skeptics' minds and hearts? Like maybe that's part of the problem. Totally and completely. You see, uh, the Hollywood part of the equation is one part, and that's the marginalizing. That's I mean, it's all these quote unquote stuff is good for movies. That's that it's allowed in movies especially if it's portrayed in these gory details and, and, and fear and everything. As soon as you put together mediums, mediumship and science, for instance, in the same sentence, you're finished. You're dead. Yeah. You see what I mean? That Absolutely. is the gap. That is the gap that we need to... Hollywood, let them go on. I mean, fine, no, that's, that's okay. The problem is the complete stronghold that physicalists, materialist worldview has on mainstream academia and possibly what is more uh, dangerous and, 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 and damaging on, on mainstream media. Because if you look at any uh, quote unquote, para the, the paranormal is only quoted uh, in, in uh, debunking terms. Yeah. NDEs, it's, it's, it's maddening for those of us who have studied the subject in certain depths, depths to see how uh, the same age old, 20, 25, sometimes 30 year old, quote unquote, explanations get regurgitated as news items on, on, on media. NDE is understood. The mystery of NDE has been cleared, and they regurgitate an explanation which was already blown out of the water 25 years ago and had already been regurgitated, resuscitated several times 
And every time the experts say, no, listen, I mean, it's not like that. It, it's, it doesn't work. It doesn't hold water. And yeah. that's, that's terrible. I honestly don't exactly know what to do apart from the fact of doing what I do and trying to, uh, to write what I write and, and talk to people like, like yourselves who are, are uh, really the, the stars in this world because they give us, and especially not us as authors, but I mean, they, they give this, you give these subjects and these themes an avenue to go out there and, and for the public to follow. Thank, that's All, very kind of you to say that. It's true. I mean, we, we, I, we as producers of information are, are just half, again, I use the metaphor of the equation, where without you, we wouldn't go anywhere. I promise you, as, as I, I, I believe it. I really I strongly believe that. Well, that is, that is, is so, it's so nice to hear that because that's really, when, when Mike and I first started this, this whole process is, you know, I've, I've been in paranormal research as well for about 20 years. And that was the one thing that I really noticed was that there was just this massive gap in information and the gifts that this information have that has it, it's it's just getting lost and you know these beautiful experiences like these near-death experiences and whatnot that are just to me just getting trashed by like you were saying old old thought processes and old knowledge and stuff that's just completely outdated the these these incredible, incredible experiences are just are getting buried. And I, I think it's so important that we, you know, we as as researchers and whatnot, if we've got that, I, I've been so thankful to have a, a very public platform. And same with Mike as well. And I, I think, you know, part of our goal really was to to be able to to present this in a way that was tangible for people and something that they could really get their head around. You know, you're like it, I just I think it's incredibly important. Your book talks a lot about near death experiences, talking about that, um, and to me, that's one of the most profound areas of of parapsychology and and this research. What case? What cases? I guess I should ask have captured your interest over the years. You see, uh, I uh, I agree. NDEs are a pillar absolutely a pillar of what I call a rational belief in life after life, agreed and granted. The point that struck me already early on in my studies, and I don't call myself a researcher, I do not produce original material. I'm a scholar. I read, I study, I, I analyze, and I, and I reflect, but I, right, having said that, Early on in my study and education process, what really struck me is the convergence, the coherence, the consistency among about a dozen different fields of investigation, of which NDE is one. Very, very important. But so is mediumship research. Very so much. is reincarnation studies. So is what I quote in the book, uh, this... Um, uh, deathbed visions or pre-death happenings and they're all fundamental elements of an edifice that supports this rational belief what i always say is is a, the, the paragon the parallel uh, that the metaphor say that i always use is the bamboo sticks say that you're in a field and you you have at some stage you come across a, a ditch and the ditch is filled with horrible mud you don't want to fall into the ditch you look around and you you, you find a, a big bamboo stick and you put it across the ditch and you say mm, perhaps if i if i had good balance i could go across uh, because the bamboo is pretty solid take one area of research but then you look around and you find another one and they put you put the two side by side, and, and there you can you can almost con comfortably get across. Then you keep looking, and you find ten, and then a hundred, and soon enough you've built a bridge of bamboo sticks. You can go across with a truck or a tank. So solid it is. So in essence, although there are each of these 
fields of investigation. I think it is my personal opinion that it, they, they are strong enough in their own right to support a rational belief in the afterlife. Taken together, any alternative looks ludicrous and the unbelievable truth becomes believable because, as I said, of the coherence, the consistency of all these fields of evidence, they all point to the same reality. Absolutely. And, you know, it's it, it's such a great analogy. I love I love that idea of the bamboo because because you're right. It is it's all these these different pieces as you're lining them up that begin to, to strengthen that that stronghold of of information and knowledge. Uh, it was funny. I had uh, Mike and I had Lizette Coley, the president of the Parapsychology Foundation on recently and we were talking about the fact that sometimes the arguments that skeptics and whatnot come out against this information are such a stretch that you, you can't even get your head around them sometimes. That, that really that bridge of bamboo is the straight way to go. It is the it is by far the the easier road to take because the information is is there and it's real and it's present. Occam's razor. It's the yes. most economical explanation for facts. And it flies, it flies in the face of, you know, a lot of things. Well, too bad. I mean, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's the case, you know. Einstein's theory of, re of relativity flew in the face of everything we, we assume to be true. You know, space, time, we we're instinctively feel that there's such, you know, unchangeable physical reality realities and Einstein came and said well sorry <laughs> no not really then he was in the field of physics and the field of physics I mean physicists are really um, fortunate unless they delve into the very very small or the very very large then things start to look a bit shaky for them too but in general in the in the realm of our everyday experience Phys physics is, is fantastic. It works so well. It explains so well and in a predictable and consistent way the world we're living. Unfortunately, parapsychology doesn't. And we have to acknowledge this. It's a, it's a, there's a beautiful book. Have you interviewed Michael Grosso by any chance? Not yet. <laughs> Please make note that that name down. You will. You, you, we will do that for a treat. Michael Grosso. Michael Grosso is an academic and a philosopher, and wrote uh, a, 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 a enlightening book uh, called uh, "Smiles of the Universe," and essentially, he reviews he reviews a number of extraordinary happenings miracles essentially and you know he uses miracles as a, as a very broad term including our research, uh, results from parapsychology and after death communication but that he puts he puts it because he has a, 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 a thesis to develop he puts them together with uh, Joseph of Cupertino and the saints and the, the religious miracles and strange happenings etc and it, what's what's interesting about his point is that all these things happen period they do happen there's there's no i mean if as as we keep telling to each other we, because we're both convinced these things happen <laughs> there's no yeah. two ways around that there's no explanation there's no skeptical analysis they do happen but dramatically for all of us they happen so haphazardly unpredictably and unreliably that it makes for a lot of frustration for all of us then he says his thesis but i i, I would like, rather have him speak about that but his basic idea is that these are quote-unquote smiles of the universe that's the universe way to remind us that there is more that we can see touch and perhaps even understand that this, I don't know, or, or, or no. No, this conversation is the one that I want to have. It is exactly the kind of thing that in my experience as a human being that I 
am seeing uh, those smiles of the universe, as you're mentioning uh, about Mr. Grosso's book. Morgan and I have talked a lot about uh, you and your book. And the one phrase that uh, really rings true to me is that we're not a body with a consciousness we lose at death. Mm. We are a consciousness with a body <laughs> we lose at death. And I, I typically will say to my friends, I am a spiritual being having a human experience. By all accounts, mm. I'm entirely convinced now what happened, you know, after, after uh, maybe a decade of this passionate and intense study, I felt that I essentially had, uh, I, I, I did my rounds. There was, I, I kept coming back to the same research and the same data. And there's a lot, but there's also a lot you can go, go through in, 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 in about 10 years. So, after 10 years of that, I, I uh, exactly as you mentioned, I, I felt drawn and, and magnetically attracted towards metaphysics, philosophy and metaphysics. And there too, I am uh, mesmerized, hypnotized, pleasantly hypnotized by concepts resonating and reverberating across about 50 centuries of human culture, history, and civilization, dating back to about 30 uh, centuries before Christ, the early Vedic scriptures were the first uh, nuggets of this non-dual thought appeared. Well, by non-dual, in, in, in metaphysics, we, we, not we, that philosophers say, speak of monistic idealism. That is, the world is made of one thing, one substance. Behind the bewildering variety of objects and manifestations, including humans, dogs, and stars, there is one single undifferentiated principle. So monism. And then idealism, this principle is consciousness. And what I find fascinating is that these concepts went straight from the early Vedic scriptures to the school of Advaita Vedanta, the non-dual uh, school of the end of the Vedas. Vedanta, I understand, means the end of the Vedas in India. And then appear independently in 500 BC, more or less, in Greece, with Plato, and particularly the Neoplatonic school of Plotinus. And then they survive all through the Middle Ages with very deep and very enlightened thinkers, mirroring and matching what the mystics of all spiritual traditions are saying, exactly the same thing. The world, the ultimate reality is one. And that ultimate reality is not matter, is consciousness. Consciousness predates matter. Consciousness actually creates matter, brings matter into being. And fascinatingly, <clears throat> this, as we all know, since we have interests in, uh, in, in, in this kind of subjects, this beautiful very high and sophisticated concepts got at the at the beginning of the 20th centuries century got support from a very unlikely quarter that is physics and as we know quantum mechanics the copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics essentially says the same thing and certain experiments of of uh, of quantum mechanics can only be interpreted as in as if Consciousness was primary and, and matters and objects secondary. Finally, the same ideas are finding now, as we speak, a beautiful contemporary formulation by idealist philosophers like Bernardo Castro. You've certainly heard of him. Absolutely. If you're, yeah. Yes. And please try to get him and interview him if you haven't done it. He is, a, he is my hero, literally. <laughs> oh, he is my intellectual hero. I don't know how somebody can pack so much intelligence to begin with 
and but also so much activity, so many activities. How can he actually <laughs> do this? I am completely mad at him, but still, I admire him, and and um, that's that's it. That's. Uh, Advaita Vedanta in, in 2020, 2022, 23. So, yes, I think that it's not only us, Mike, who are, who are uh, spiritual beings having an earthly incarnation. The world, the universe, is a spiritual being appearing and thinking, <laughs> masquerading as, as a material universe. That's my... Uh, I uh, think it's. Oh, I think I'm it's saying this with a smile, but at the bottom of myself, that's what I believe. Well, it's what Mike and Mike and I have talked about so many times because we are completely on the same page, and yeah, you know, we've we've had so many we discuss so many discussions over the over the last number of months and and couple of years that you know consciousness is more and more being seen as something that is is fundamental to the universe it's not emergent from the brain and you know that whole david chalmers hard problem of is consciousness fundamental or emergent is slowly i think becoming obvious that there's you know there there is so so much and when we can shift the paradigm of the like we were talking about the materialism and shift the paradigm that there is you know the consciousness and the brain or the brain is 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 the translator i think so many of these these puzzles that we're we're struggling with are are going to be answered yeah exactly they're they're going to go away let me let me say two things in this respect if i may quickly uh, and and these are these are two points of uh, of high hopes and if not expectations at least they're very hopeful points number one uh, Bernardo Castro has been uh, often published by Science, Science Magazine, which we, I think we can agree is one of the bastions of obdurate materialism and physicalism. It really is. Yep. Isn't it? But they did publish Bernardo with some really hard stuff of, of his, you know, monistic idealism. Obviously, they did because he, 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 brings, he brings experiments and data. And it's not only good at thinking, he's also good at looking at, at elements of uh, scientific evidence that the scientists understand and can follow. So the fact that he has been published and, and uh, has, has got traction and an audience there, I think is a very good uh, signal, if you want. And the other thing, perhaps less known, and perhaps another name I'm sure you're familiar with, but if not, uh, look look for him, Jack Hunter. <laughs> yes, a friend, I know Jack Hunter well. There you go. Then, and I, I'm no, no need to say anything more. Perhaps my observation on that is that we could, uh, I received yesterday uh, the latest issue of the Journal of the Society for Psychical Research. And no longer than two hours ago, having a glass of wine, uh, I told my wife, look at this magazine, this journal of a, an august and respectable scientific organization. It had two original papers, one personally, I think, totally irrelevant, and, and completely out, well, anyhow, my, my, own, my own very, very humble uh, interpretation. Two thirds of the magazine was actually uh, book reviews. Is this a scientific publication or is yeah. this the sign of a dying area of science? One could be authorized to think the latter, but then, you know, psychical research is being kept alive by the likes of Jack Hunter and his sociologist. It has moved into sociology, which is not really, uh, yeah, that there, there, there were a few, a few studies, but it's them who have taken the baton and they're going on with his, uh, you know, para-anthropology um, magazine and, and, and open open research projects and they're doing a lot of good stuff so the field is not dead the field the field has moved into into other 
other areas and other directions. And I think this is very positive. I, I think it's needed because I, you know what I've what I've watched over the years, which I I think is really interesting, is that evolution and that evolution into quantum physics, that evolution into like sociology, um, you know, even into areas of psychology and, and things like that. And I think in order for this to gain ground in the way it needs to, just, just my opinion, I, I think that's what needs to happen. I, I think it needs to expand so it, it can't be stuck on that, that, that sort of fringe element that people label it as. I think if it if they if it's brought into some of these other areas, I I don't know. I mean, I'm maybe I'm just I'm grasping at straws, but um, I you know I I think seeing these other areas begin to acknowledge it is going to greatly help people to to get their head around the fact that this isn't all just you know woo woo seances, you know. Absolutely, this remains a job for the likes of you and I, uh, you two and I in in our respective capacities. Although I understand you are. Uh, scholars and researchers in your own right, our mission, if you want, our, uh, you know, efforts to educate is paternalistic, to inform, to share what we know and understand with as broad a public as possible. And, 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 and as I say, uh, trying to reach because those who are uh, count more on intuition and perhaps are, are, are open to faith and taking things based, as I say, on, on, on faith and belief, fine. I mean, um, I'm, I'm okay with that. But I think my, my public is a, is a thinking public, is a, th is a public who can be convinced by facts, can be convinced by arguments. And I think there's a lot of people out there. Think, for instance, of all the people who you see when you take a, a, a plane, and, and you see them reading popular science books or popular science magazines. That's a very good thing because a lot of people have a sincere, a true interest in these subjects. How can we reach them saying that, you know, yes. what we talk about is of the same seriousness, sorry, I dare say is more serious than a lot of the important science that gets out there. Let me just mention, cosmology in the last 20 years is a circus, I believe, yeah. you know, a circus, a free for all where thousands of papers get published and gazillions of dollars in, in funding are, are awarded to ideas which are completely mad, unprovable. Everything is, every new theory is custom made and, and created out of almost nothing to try to make a certain model fit with reality and reality says something else and they're allowed to do that. Okay. Yeah. I love, I love your analogy there of, of, and, and explanation of, of the fact that people are, are trying to, trying to use science to justify a false a false paradigm or a, a false belief. I, I think you hit the nail on the head with that. Maybe false. I mean, wrong. I, yeah. I think that the, what they call the lambda cold model of uh, la lambda cold matter model of uh, cosmic expansion, it, it or it, the, the, the traditional big bang bang model, which is trumpeted down the throat of every student is perhaps wrong. False is a big thing, but it's wrong and it's been shored yeah. up. Every new finding opens cracks and, and in, open to, in order to shore up that theory, new theories are, are, are invented. Anyhow, you see what I'm saying. And the other big area, which, which pains me a lot because it has contributed enormously in, in certain applications is, is evolutionary theory. I mean, evolutionary theory, as it is formulated by, by Darwin, you know, uh, not evolution by the, the random mutations, and natural selection, is intellectually most beautiful. It seems to work in, 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 uh, very well, but then if you look at the evidence, it's, it's, oh, 
God is another circus. You know, I mean, if you look at the fossil record, it is simply not there. It Very is simply not there. And, and uh, that's major. And there have been books published, like in our case, you know. I, I'm, if, if there's anything that makes me mad, these are conspiracy theories, right? I'm not claiming that there's a conspiracy. <laughs> there's a lot of them. <laughs> I, I am absolutely not, God forbid. But it is a fact, however, that uh, quite significant books have been written by very, very important people, very knowledgeable people, saying, sorry, it doesn't look like that. And as usual, you know, they've got their public, they've got their limited traction, but then the world goes on with random selection, the random mutation and natural selection. End of story. That's, that's, the, that's it. So why, why do we need to look any further? Yeah, I, I think there's, there's this element that's, that's becoming more pervasive, and it's definitely, I, I think, become more pervasive over the last couple of years, is that this, you know, that we've, we've kind of learned everything we need to know, and science has almost become a, a religion rather than a tool to, to explore a lot of these really incredible things. Like, you know, like we were talking about things like near death experience and whatnot. And then as soon as somebody comes and says, this is, you know, oh no, no, that's, that's explained, that's explained. And when it's, it's not at all. And, you know, that's, I think one of the things that drives me a little crazy is the fact that no, they're, they're not, we're, we're not, we're not at that point. We are at the very beginning of understanding consciousness and what it is and and our role as consciousness and within it i i think we're just we're really just beginning to understand a little bit of our 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 piece in the in in the puzzle and it's it's a universal phenomenon you know it's it's something that we we can't ignore we can't ignore if we want to move forward in in our our growth as as human beings and i think that's one of the reasons why for me parapsychology is is and and whatnot has become so important because it's not just the study of of things that go bump in the night it is so much bigger than what people want to to allow for and i, I know that's one of the things that uh you know mike and i we we really wanted to to put pull to the forefront when we we started this show is that this is this is such a, a question for for everybody to immerse themselves in because it's it's relevant to everyone. Why, Morgan? Because that is exactly what you you, you said in, at the beginning of of your last piece. That is, science has become uh, a religion. Uh, first of all, in the eyes of uh, uh, those the, the professional scientists and mainstream academia. Science is the only, science as we understand natural science, is the only way to learn about the world. This is called scientism, and it's colossally wrong, because we know that there are other ways to, to know about the world. The fact that my wife and I had a glass of wine two hours ago has not appeared in a peer-reviewed journal. Nevertheless, it is a fact. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> End of story. <laughs> End of story. So there's more than what appears in peer-reviewed journals, we, 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 which have their own failures, but we don't want to get into that. So number one, there are more ways to learn about life, the world, and everything than the methods of natural science. Number two, science is certainly not a set of ideas as it is perceived to be and presented to be. Science says, hold on. Typically, what you read in, in mainstream media is the opinion of scientists, not necessarily the yeah. result of, you know, of, of, of natural science as we know it. Science is a method as we know. And the method has only one commandment, one commitment, follow the data. End of story. Follow the data and go where the data bring you. 
So there's not a monolithic idea of science as, as you know, as, as science is not a set of opinion. That's, that's what I, I, I wanted to stress. Now, uh, years ago, I heard this from somebody, and I don't know if this somebody was quoting somebody else, but I loved it so much. And it went something like, you know, at some stage, philosophy called in one of the servants called science and told the servant, go out in the world, look around and come back and speak and tell me what you've seen. I don't know if you understand the mutual relationship. Science and what science finds is at the service of philosophy. And philosophy is the love of knowing, knowledge, understanding. Science is one of the servants. There are many. But I, so in the case of parapsychology and broadly speaking, psychical research, the results of that feed into the reflection of what the world is what is our position in the world and exactly the same, the things you've you've said. So I paraphrased you. I have not added <laughs> an iota <laughs> to what you just said, <laughs> but just to say that we agree. Uh, science, uh, science tends to become the god of the atheist, really. Um, it, it, you know, we, we all have something that we believe in. We all have some sort of I idea that we think explains the universe and it's interesting how science becomes that bastion that place for for people to hide from <laughs> from the rest of the world kind of thing it's like uh it it closes the mind in a way it, except it doesn't mike it does not explain it explains a lot of things and it can make a lot of use of useful things like mobile phones and computers but in terms of the big questions, it's completely silent. Silence is a deafening silence. And as I say, as the the the, uh, if you look into into the big subjects, the the infinite, infinitely small and the infinitely large, we are in complete chaos and, and obscurity. We are no closer today than we were 200 years ago. Uh, and then Stephen Hawking famously said, you know, in 20 years, we will have had all our answers. And 20 years later said, in another 20 years, <laughs> we will have all the answers. And then he sadly died. <laughs> and uh, so there is science <laughs> has this promissory, this promissory uh, um, character. Look at, again, I mean, oh, yes, right. And these, uh, yeah, the, the more honest, uh, so to called skeptics or scoffers say, yes, we agree that, uh, uh, that the explanations we've presented, we put forward so far don't work. Yeah, but we're on the verge of having. So there's the promise of something. Consciousness, there are, I, I don't know, 20, 25 competing theories for what consciousness is and it, uh, what, how it is organized. None accounts for the facts. And then they say, oh, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, but we don't know yet, but we're nearly there. Give us another few years and a, another little funding and we're nearly it's there. It's not the truth. <laughs> Sorry, we're not. We're not. As I say, maybe Stephen Hawking does know the truth now. I mean, you know. No, I'm sure he does. I mean, first hand experience, <laughs> by all accounts. <laughs> well, this, Piero, this has been absolutely wonderful and so incredibly enlightening. And I hope that we can have you back in the future because this has been just incredible. Um, I'd love for you in the next couple of minutes here to tell people where they can find your incredible incredible book because I highly recommend it. That's really kind. But let before that, let me say, Morgan, that's been I've done a lot of these shows and I generally enjoy because I'm 
you know, people say because of your Italian origins, you're an extrovert. Yes, but I'm, I'm an Italian from the north. My mom was Swiss. And anyhow, my, my self-identity today is, is, is British for, the, you know, the better of the, or the worse. So it's not that, it's that I like, you know, I like performing. Uh, the, I loved my, my many years of university teachings because I, I like to share these things. And my, uh, my feeling is that this was not, if, if it was a little, a little enlightening, it was not because of me. Because, I mean, we're three people who come from the same background in terms of knowledge and, and, and understanding, have the same ideas. And so I felt like this was a discussion amongst almost, I would say, their say, friends who have the same interests and the same ideas. So I, <laughs> I'm no guru of any kind, <laughs> giving enlightenment to anybody. Anyhow. Anybody of the listeners who want to, to, to know a little bit more about this subject may visit DR as the prefix for Dr. DR Parisetti, Paris like the city in France, ETTI at the end, DR Parisetti, one word, dot com. There you will find uh, several free articles some of which I, I dare say are a little technical, particularly there's, there's a 19 page really critical examination of the NDEs from a medical standpoint and a demolition of all the, of all the explanations that have been put forward so far. And as I say, is a little technical, but there are ad other articles as, uh, as well. There's a completely free book that anybody can download right away. There's no email, no nothing. You click and you download a book on apparitions, which is, uh, which is an interesting book as well, uh, which I've written actually before the last one. There's my quote-unquote bestseller. That's 21 Days into the Afterlife. That's written, oh, many years ago. But still, people write to me saying that... And, it's been referred to as, quote, the best introduction to, um, to the survival hypothesis. Best, not because I'm the best, not at all, but perhaps <laughs> because I've had a, a happy idea of presenting the evidence in the form of a dialogue between myself and a skeptic. And in 21 days, we explore 21 actually a little less uh, 18 areas of evidence in a continuous dialogue and it's actually in reality is a dialogue between me when i wrote the book and myself before i started this process saying what the heck are you talking about <laughs> that's really completely bonkers <laughs> and, and 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 this 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 you know solid you know oh no this is complete nonsense gradually crumbles and and that's what people like and I'm, I'm told it gets read in one sitting and blah blah and then there's the last book uh, step into the light which was my to you are you familiar i know i'm i'm I, i'm aware of time i will keep this very short are you uh, do you know in in canada because in the us they don't do you know what the Lonely Planet guides are? Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. Right? You've heard of that? I've I've not heard of that. that's new for me. Mike does, Morgan doesn't. Lonely Planet is a beautiful idea that dates from from many years ago. Uh, they say, you know, if you want to learn about Thailand and you want to visit Thailand, who's the best source of information? Guess what? People who have been to Thailand, isn't it? So already for maybe fifty years now. Uh, uh, Lonely Planet has been collecting reports from travelers who go to places, and there's a Lonely Planet guy for any country in the world. Mm -hmm. They simply col collect and collate reports from people who have visited these places. And, and, and it, it's beautiful. It's a, a treasure trove of information about these countries. So I thought of writing the, the Lonely Planet guide to the afterlife. Uh, asking people who either are there in the case of after-death communication or to peek peek at it as in the case of near-death experiences or are preparing for it as in the case of uh, deathbed visions. And so the first part of the book 
establishes the credibility of these sources. At the end of the first half of the book, as you know, because you've read it and I'm, I'm glad you did, uh, we, we, we understand that we as rational people, as thinking people, we can trust, it is reasonable to trust these sources. In the second half, we look at what these sources say. We look at the reports that have been sent into the Lonely Planet about what happens before death, at the moment of death, and then in the many steps that happen uh, after death. And uh, yes, here too, several people have written to me saying that it was a happy idea and this was helpful to them. Please write that book. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> everything, everything is available on drparisetti.com. And we will share that link uh, as and the, and the papers as well on, on our pages so that everybody out there listening can find them. Uh, because it's it is it's just such it's important work and and you're so full of knowledge and, and full of information and and I think I speak on behalf of both Mike and I when I say like we we agree it's this is a, a incredible conversation between friends and this is it's just been absolutely wonderful Piero thank you so much it is me to thank you and again I remind you of the fundamental role you have and I it's me to thank you for that Lovely speaking to you. Thank you so much. Here's Morgan for this episode's segment of Spiritual Healthcare. In this episode's edition of Spiritual Healthcare, the segment of the show where you get to be the creator and designer of your paranormal and spiritual experience, we're going to tell you about a process called virtual reality. This process is perfect for when you're feeling good already and want to add even more momentum to a manifestation or creative project. This is a process to avoid if you're in negative emotion or disconnection, as you don't want to add creative power to those emotions and visions. Before you start this exercise, take time to imagine the life you really want. Close your eyes and breathe deeply. Inhale and exhale three times and let go of any worry or resistant thought that may be lingering. When you're ready, imagine yourself sitting in your vision. What is it for you? Imagine yourself in a place, emotionally and physically, that you really want to be. This may be a place you already know, or a place you are creating for yourself. Be imaginative. This could be a place you're familiar with, or a place you are wanting. Once you have this place in your mind, Look around, side to side, up and down. What's there? Who's there? Can you see details? Now, take note of the most important factor. How do you feel? How you feel as you're sitting there is the frequency that reality exists upon. Does it feel like freedom, joy, fun, love, playfulness? Immerse yourself in that emotion. When you are ready, open your eyes, but hold the feeling place. This is a place you can return to whenever your vision needs a refresher. And if you can bring the frequency of that place into your everyday, we promise you, you will begin to see the essence of your vision begin to materialize in your life. You need nothing to be happy, but you need something to be sad. And remember, at the end of seeking, all is consciousness. Stay in peace, everyone. Thank you for listening to this episode of Supernatural Circumstances, a co-production of Entity Seeker Paranormal Research and Teachings and Good Egg Studios. This podcast is part of the Curious Cast podcast network. Theme music by Corey Johnson of Catalyst Records in Edmonton, Alberta. You can find out more about Morgan Knudsen at entityseeker.ca and more about me and listen to my other show at darkpatine.com. Feel free to email the show at supernaturalcircumstances at gmail.com. Good night for now. <laughs>